Well, this is Radio TV Phono Nut, and I'll admit this is highly unusual for me, but tonight we have a Samsung 32-inch LCD TV on the bench from 2012. This was given to me a few nights ago. The guy said it just started acting up, and he called a local repair shop, and they told him it was either a bad panel or a bad sensor and that he'd be looking at at least $200 and he'd be better off to buy a new TV. So let's fire it up and see exactly what happens here. If I can get to my outlet. They were powered up. So it fires up, screen lights up, it shuts down, and fires up, screen lights up, shuts down again. Now, I don't claim to be an LCD TV repair expert by any sense of the word. Actually, I don't consider myself an expert in anything, but from what I can tell about these LCDs, when they when they light up like that and shut down, it's usually a problem with one of the backlights or, or the inverter board that supplies power to the backlights. Now this 32 inch TV is unbelievably light. In fact, this little 12 inch black and white TV probably weighs more than this 32 inch set. But this 12 inch black and white TV is 35 years old and still going strong. Here's the model number tag, manufactured August 2012. Not very old to be having problems, but as, as we know, a lot of these newer TVs don't last like the old ones did. So let's pull the back and see if I can find anything that's easily fixable. I mean, it was free, so worth a shot. If it if I can't fix it easily and cheaply then then we can EOL it. Okay, remove the back and the first thing I see is this capacitor on the power supply board that's bulged up. So that'll be the first order of business is to replace that capacitor and maybe I'll actually get lucky. Yeah, I'm not gonna count on it though. Well, this is funny. While working on the 2012 junker, my junker from 1981 decided to start acting up. We all of a sudden lost sound, and we have no, we have a vertical roll. So, guess what I'm going to be fixing after we do something with this thing. Okay, 47 microfarad, 160 volt, 105 degree. Let's see what brand this is. It's obviously not a Nichicon or a Panasonic. Uh, this is a Samwa brand, the ultimate in garbage capacitors. And we'll be replacing it with a good quality Nichicon 47 at 200 volts, high temperature. Well, looks like that did it, or at least it improved things. I'm confident, confident enough that I'm going to go ahead and put this set back together and use it. Now, what I should do is just recap this whole board, get rid of all of these garbage Samwa capacitors, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'll just use the set until it dies and then worry about it then. It's not like I have any money in it. Or I might try to sell the set and make a dollar off of it. Yeah, I like that idea better. I'm like dance step. Well, I think that did it. Unfortunately, the only button on this set that I can find is the... Well, wait a minute. Maybe this is something. I thought that was a power button. So I'm not used to this modern technology. Okay, I figured it out. It's a one button does all kind of thing. See we can pick up any stations here off of the air.
Terry Allen, and I am the fastest man alive. Hello. In the traditional motion picture, usually defeated. Welcome to Martha. This is many female night jam. channels it's available here's the old capacitor it reads 5.5 microfarad should read 47 so yeah it's it's exhausted itself okay just a few notes on capacitor replacement in these in these modern TVs before we leave this when you replace an electrolytic capacitor in a modern television or any other modern electronics for that matter, you want to try to go with one that's high temperature, at least rated at 105 degrees Celsius and low ESR. And you want to go with a name brand cap such as Nichicon or Panasonic. These Samwa caps are the result of bean counters and they're and they're garbage and when you want to replace the capacitor you want to make sure to observe correct polarity most all modern caps have the negative end designated by a band on the capacitor you want to make sure the new capacitor is installed the same way otherwise you could be in some big trouble and also take note that a capacitor can be perfectly flat on top and still be bad, so you know don't overlook that possibility. We just got lucky on this one that it was bloated out the top, and obviously that one's bad. And to replace the capacitor, you'll need some common hand tools such as a screwdriver to remove the back and the power supply board, and you'll need a pencil soldering iron. You don't have to have an elaborate solder, soldering station, but you do need a pencil soldering iron suitable for working on printed circuit boards. And some desoldering braid would help. I use the Chemtronics brand. And some rosin coal electronics solder is necessary. And you'll use the desoldering braid to remove the solder from the old capacitor. You just simply lay the, sol the desoldering braid on top of the solder joint and then place the tip of your soldering iron on top of the braid until you suck all of the solder up. Then you remove the old capacitor, install the new capacitor, bend the leads back, resolder the new capacitor in place, or should I say solder the capacitor in place. We're not resoldering anything. And then once it's soldered in place, you just use your wire cutters to cut off the excess leads. Put the board back in the set, and hopefully you'll be in business. Okay, now that we've repaired the Samsung, let's see what's wrong with our shop TV. It's a pretty safe bet this will probably be the only YouTube, the only video on YouTube where you'll see the repair of a modern day set and the repair of a vintage TV both in the same video. Okay we have picture static when we turn the volume control but no audio. Maybe this TV got ticked off because I had a, a newer TV on the bench and it decided it would stop working so let's open it up and see if we can find the problem. Okay they were nice enough to put a parts location diagram inside the back of the set. You can see we have a sound IC which is basically the sound IF circuitry. We have a sound regulator transistor, not quite sure what that is. We have a driver transistor and then we have two output transistors. Well, we know the 
final audio stage is working because we get a buzz whenever we I can touch one of the pins on the IC and get a buzz. So I highly suspect, based on past experience, that this IC is probably the problem. Whenever I was a kid, I used to pick up these little 12-inch black and white TVs at yard sales for a dollar or two, that, and then I'd bring them home and fix them and sell them. And this this audio IC was a common failure. Uh, one of the one of them was an NTE 712. I think there were two or three of them, but I remember one of them was a 712, and it would go bad and cause the problem that we're having here. As you can hear, we're getting a buzz. So that tells us that the final output stage is working. And if you don't know what you're doing, you don't need to be probing around with a TV inside of a TV with your finger on the metal probe, but this is a low voltage area where there's no danger of me getting shocked. But if you don't know what you're doing, you could very easily get zapped. Here's the original IC, and it indeed crosses over to an NTE 712, which I happen to be lucky enough to have one. Not sure this is the problem, but since we have the part and it didn't cost us anything, we're going to put it in there and see what happens. Now, if I had a schematic to this set, I would, I would do a little digging before condemning the IC, but... Since this part was such a high failure part back in the day, I'll just go ahead and replace it. And if it don't fix it, I'll just put the old part back in it. Okay, I finally got the other IC in, which I think was a used one actually, but hopefully it was good. And it took me a better part of an hour to do because of these staggered pins on the original. The replacement had the pin straight in a row, so I had to bend each pin back. And trying to get it lined up was a major pain in the butt. In fact, this TV come real close to to being EOL a time or two. So if the part fixes it, great. If it doesn't fix it, it can just stay in there because I'm not going through that realignment process again. So now the moment of truth. All right, let's see. Well, it appears that that solved the problem. We now have audio again. But we have retrace lines in the picture, so what's going on with that? Section here on volunteer opportunities. Well, the picture's back, but we have retrace lines. When you turn the brightness up, as you can see. But who knows, I could have broken a wire during all of this because I was highly frustrated. You know, this may be the problem. I believe I broke one end of the lead off. It's going to this neon bulb that attaches to the CRT socket. So let me dig around and see if I can find another neon bulb somewhere. Okay, that neon bulb replacement took care of the retrace lines, as you can see. And when I found out you were dating my ex-husband, I thought... Oh my God, I'm such a uh, okay, the workbench TV is back in operation until the next time. I don't want bounce. I want. I want cozy TV. That's the only channel worth watching. So yeah, this is one instance where the more modern TV turned out to be less of a pain in the butt than the older TV, but. At least we have our workbench TV back going again. Alright, there you go. Thanks for watching and more to come later.